Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. I'm Sarah Shahab from the Anwar Gargash Diplomatic Academy. Um, our panel here today is about the 50% cabinet. So far, every panel and every presentation that we've heard today have em emphasized um, some quite depressing and sobering statistics about um, the, the, the fact that women are not represented enough in government, in the private sector, in tech, in science, um, in diplomacy, as we've just heard from, from uh, Dr. Munira. So, um, but it's very important to also look at the glass half full. For every country where women are underrepresented, either in economics or in government, we have success stories of countries and, and women who are leading the charge and trailblazing uh, paths that were never seen before and making sure that women are given the opportunity to serve at the highest levels of government. Um, and whether it's diplomacy, whether it's the military, and whether it's the, the private sector. Um, and joining me here today to discuss this, um, these success stories and how to forge ahead um, and continue on, on, on trailblazing these paths are two admirable women. I am joined today by Her Excellency Marta Lucia Ramirez, the Vice President of Colombia and the Foreign Affairs Minister of um, Colombia, and Her Excellency Claire Akamanzi, the CEO of uh, Rwanda's Development Board and also a cabinet uh, uh, member um, of Rwanda's government. Um, and I look forward to your insightful um, experience. So let's just get started with the first question that I would like to address to Her Excellency uh, Vice President uh, Ramirez. Um, Vice President, in, um, when you were Defense Minister, um, women in Colombia were not allowed or were not able to become generals. And you made sure to change that policy um, to ensure that women are able to, 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 to serve at the highest level in their military careers if they were, um, of course, if they had the, the, the right merits and the right qualifications. Um, and this is something, you know, that, that, that will stay a, a part of your legacy for a very long time. So let me ask you this. Why was it important for you to include women's voices in Colombia's military? And how are you continuing to do so in your position as vice president? Well, thank you very much for me. It's a honor to be here and to represent uh, Colombia and, uh, of course, not only uh, our government policies, which has been very focused in uh, open opportunities for women, but also to uh, insist that when women are in leadership position, we have the responsibility to open room for other women. But, of course, this uh, room must be a, a consequence of women capacities and, of course, of women a decision to serve, to change a societies. And yes, that's truth. When I was a defense minister in Colombia, I was the first defense minister as a woman in Colombia. We used to have a very hard conflict because of guerrilla, narco-trafficking, whatever. So it was a very challenging time. And on that time, women were not allowed to be a general, when they become a, a colonels, they have to leave forces. So it was, the, it was the ceiling for them. And I insist with the president that was on that moment, President Uribe, no, we have to leave them to compete. And if they are capable, they have to uh, have the chance, the opportunity to become generals. And he said, yes, it was so difficult and it proves me that if you want to change society, you have to be ready to fight for others, not for yourself. True. And this is so important because sometimes people feel that women are fighting for women. No, we are fighting for society, for have a real change in societies. So for us, it was so important to have women as generals because they were very focused in this very close relation between the population and the military forces, the population and the police forces. And now we have generals in the Army, in the Air Force, no, in the Air Force, not yet. Uh, now we have in the police. Uh, but this is something that has been changing very positive, this relation between the uh, public forces and the Colombian population. Now it's different. It was 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. Now it's uh, very clear that there are so many women in very high level positions in the military and in other sectors of the Colombian society. But 
you have to fight. You have to fight for others if you want to serve your society. Um, and Good. turning, yeah. Um, turning to um, Rwanda, I think Rwanda is a great example of a country that has overcome, um, you know, a very painful history and has grown so much economically. And Claire, you've overseen that that progress and that huge economic growth that that Rwanda has witnessed. So. Turning to um, the Rwandan experience, um, why was it, in, why, in what capacity, and, and did you include women in this, you know, nation building process? And, and how do you continue to do so to make sure that women are equal participants with men on Rwanda's, um, you know, growth for economic recovery and economic growth? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And it's indeed a pleasure to be part of this panel uh, with you, Vice President. Now, um, let's start with the statistics. Uh, today, Rwanda has the highest number of women in parliament. 61% of our women, uh, of our parliament is composed of women. And of course, that means that the speaker of parliament is a woman. Uh, of course, she was voted by the women uh, being the majority in parliament. But also 53% of our cabinet uh, is women. And about 40% of our, of our Senate uh, is also composed of women. Rwanda is today ranked the seventh country in the world when it comes to gender global parity by the World Economic Forum. But what made that possible? I, I remember beginning of this year, there was a big story in the news. For those of you who follow soccer, uh, African Cup of Nations, the first woman uh, to referee uh, any African Cup of Nations was a woman called Salima Mukansanga. And it was big news because for 60 years of the existence of the African Cup of Nations, there had never been a woman referee. It was always a man um, that was a referee in that cup. So it was, it was very exciting news, and it was all over the news. And this woman happened to be from Rwanda, not surprising. <laughs> and she got a lot of interviews. Why is it that you were able to go into this male-dominated field and become a referee? Can you imagine? men playing with emotion, with adrenaline, trying to win their you know, soccer game, and they have to listen to a whistle that is blown by a woman. I think that's really, really powerful. And, um, but that woman is part of the society or the environment that has been uh, developed over years in Rwanda. And for Rwanda, it's been a deliberate uh, number of, uh, about three decades of including women right from the struggle that stopped the genocide against the Tutsis. If you hear the stories of um, how the genocide against the Tutsis was stopped by this RPF movement, which is a movement that women played a very big role. And women pro proved themselves at the time, before they took over government, when they were still in the struggle. Uh, today, you probably know my president, President Paul Kagame, who led the struggle at the time. He will tell you stories of how women proved themselves. They went out there. Not many of them were you know, in uniform and fighting but they took another role of mobilizing, mobilizing money, mobilizing resources, mobilizing assets that were very crucial for the, for the, for the struggle to win and for the genocide against the Tutsis to be stopped. So when the government started in 1994, women were already something that people were used to, the men were used to, because they really had proven themselves. But maybe just as I close this question, I think maybe three main um, factors were very important and continue to be very important as we include women in Rwanda to get those numbers that I talked about. The first one is political will. You can never underestimate political will. You can have policies, you can have laws, but you have to have the political will that is very serious about including women. My president likes to tell stories of how sometimes he asks for a list of people to appoint in cabinet or in institutions of government. And they bring him a list and he says, but these are all men, where are the women? And they tell him, we looked everywhere, there was no woman. We couldn't find a woman that was qualified to be in this space agency or this uh, you know, institution or Rwanda Revenue Authority, or whatever it is that they're looking for a woman. And he'll tell them, okay, you take back the list and when you find a woman, I'll be ready to make the appointment. And guess what? A woman was found like two days later or three days later all the time. So if you're not deliberate, whether it's at the political level or even as a company, if you're the CEO of the company or chairman of the board, you have to insist on those women who are qualified, who will deliver and who perform will actually show up. That's one. Two, uh, legal framework. Extremely important to have the laws or the policies that support this. We have um, a constitution that requires 30% of parliamentary, of um, any political office must be occupied by women, so 30%. 
And today we're at 61 or 50%, but that was able to create um, a, founding, uh, a founding base. The third one is you don't just, you know, political will appointments or you put the laws and policies, but that's not enough. You have to always monitor. And I think one of the, the, the points we saw was gender mainstreaming. You have to make it a practice of how you mainstream gender in everything that you do. For us, one example I want to share is budget. Your budget cannot pass parliament if there's no gender component of the budget. You must show, if you're getting $10 million from the Treasury, you must show how $10 million that we're going to give you as the Treasury is going to help you advance gender um, in the work that you do, if it's agriculture or if it's business entrepreneurship, whatever you do, security, there has to be a component of how that money is going to be used uh, for promoting women. So those practices, day to day, have to be embedded. And at, at the end of the day, women deliver. At least what we've seen in Rwanda, women deliver. And when you, once you see this, the, the progress is just going to continue being there. Thank you. Thank you. I want to play devil's advocate, but I would first like to start with the disclaimer that I don't personally believe what, what I'm about to say. However, um, so what? I want to ask the question, so what? How does it matter if women make up 53% of, of Rwanda's cabinet or 45% of Colombia's cabinet, and I believe it was 50% a few years ago? Um, there are a lot of skeptics out there that would say, you know, gender doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman as long as the job is getting done. Um, and I, I have to deal with these skeptics at work every day, trust me, which is why I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here. So, my follow-up question is, you know, what do these women bring to the table that, what do these women bring to the table that men don't? What is the value add of having women serve in cabinet or constitute, um, you, you said 61% of, of, of Rwanda's parliament. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're the first, Madam, Madam Vice President, you're the first Madam Vice President, uh, but hopefully not, not the last um, in Colombia. But what have you brought to the table um, and what have these women brought to the table that men have, have not done? Thank you very much. I like very much the, the approach that you are giving because this is not only an issue of numbers. This is not only to have 50% mm. or whatever. It's how do you change yes. society through a participation of women? And let me say, first of all, uh, for the entire uh, humanity history, 50% of humanity have been a part of power economic power and political power. Mm -hmm. And if you include this 50%, for sure you can change societies. You can change the quality of uh, humanity. So uh, in many cases that I have met, it's not only me, uh, women bring to the table capacity, but also this sensitivity about society. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there are so many studies, for example, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, she made a study in the World Bank uh, about law. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you have a legal frame to open room for women, uh, it shows that women really can change in different sectors. For example, in the economy, for example, uh, in, in, uh, science, in science and technology and innovation. So what you have to do is to open room because if women have all the training, experience, they are going to bring some other instruments in order to help society to change. Uh, many women in parliament, they bring this commitment with the uh, uh, economic care, for example. Uh, we in Colombia, now we are very focused, and this is the first time, and let me say hello to the First Lady of Colombia, she's uh, joining us. This is the first time that we are working also in the uh, economy uh, care. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you know, women are in care of family, of uh, children and elder people without any payment. And sometimes without any pensions or any uh, social security. So our government is focused in including all these uh, care economy and to provide conditions for these women to have at the end of their lives pensions or to have a social uh, security. So uh, women in parliament, for example, uh, are bringing not only this uh, concern about how to improve conditions of life for family, but also how to improve economy itself. Mm -hmm. So if we have a better economic growth, if we have better opportunities to create jobs, for example, 
we are going to have better societies mm -hmm. and we are going to see the improvements uh, of societies and nations. So um, I, I, I just believe that when women are in leadership positions, they are concerned for society, for families, but also for these sectors of uh, society who have been apart. Uh, let me share with you one experience. Now, uh, as a vice president, I ask the president, I would like to bring uh, gender issues to the vice presidency of Colombia, because previous vice president, they were not uh, concerned about gender issues. So I brought uh, gender issues. And we have created a wonderful policy which is focused in economic empowerment for women. We are convinced that when women have economic autonomy, women are less uh, uh, are less risk uh, about security. Mm -hmm. uh, when women have economic autonomy, they have the capacity to defend themselves and they have the capacity to change uh, things on their lives because they have this economic security. We also uh, create in Colombia a fund to provide uh, not only loans, but also uh, to provide um, uh, resources for Colombian gender uh, companies which are owned by women. So now through the, uh, uh, through the um, public, um, uh, 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 all the, 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 the budget for, for the um, uh, public uh, um, um, sales and public, uh, um, I, I forgot the, 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 the name. Uh, so when we buy uh, in the public sector, now we are giving a kind of preference to uh, uh, companies which are owned by women. Mm -hmm. So if they have the same quality, same prices, we choose a company which is owned by women because now we are clear that they are also creating wealth and they are creating jobs in Colombia. So that's why for us it's so important to have this uh, uh, um, budget and also the capacity to have money to give loans and to give uh, women opportunity to create their own uh, companies. Uh, when you have a woman in their leadership role, for example, we have a woman, so many women in leadership roles now in Colombia, so this is changing very rapid. We have a woman who is the president of the association of private uh, companies who are uh, building houses in the housing sector. So these women, because she is women and myself, we work together in order to train women for the housing sector. Now we have so many women in the very basic uh, part of the housing sector, but there are also engineers, architects, CEOs of housing companies. So it's because we have been focusing how to train women to be part of this sector. In Colombia, in our paritary cabinet, this is the first time that a, a country has a paritary, paritary cabinet. So we had a very important women, very specialized in their own sectors. So at the beginning, for example, I remember the energy minister. She is very good in energy, but she was also very focused in some uh, kind of uh, policies in order to have electricity for very poor uh, rural areas. So it's because she was with this sensitiveness about these poor areas. So she was in a very uh, sophisticated level of the, uh, the energy sector. She was uh, doing with present the transition to a renewable energy, but at the same time, she was very focused in what about these poor people who has no electricity. So this is this kind of balance very good training, very high level of uh, knowledge, but also very commit, a, a high commitment with society, with families, with uh, poor people. So we have so many uh, different experiences that shows us that if you want to change societies, if you want to improve uh, economic growth, if you want to create wealth and jobs, you need to introduce women as part of the economy and as part of the, uh, of the um, uh, rules uh, in different sectors of the, of the society. Women in power can create better societies. That's it. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> in um, Colombia, we don't have a law to ask at least 30% uh, of women in uh, positions. We used to have a law 
that ask uh, political parties to have at least 30% of candidates. Mm -hmm. But now we are promoting that it's not important if you have women in the list. What it's important is that you can have women elected. So this is something mm -hmm. that we are pushing in the political parties. They have to open room for more women in the parliament. For example, in Colombia, we used to have only 10% of women uh, in the Senate and also in the representative's house. Now, because uh, our president has this paritary cabinet, uh, the political parties and women are very interested to increase their participation in politics. We have had an election only two weeks ago, and we passed from 19% to 30% of the participation of women in the Colombian Congress. So I am convinced that in the next election for years, mm. we are going to have 50%. Why? Because this is this a very positive change in the society, and there are so many women who are uh, participating. And we create a, a, a school in order to uh, provide leadership and to provide training for women in politics. So this is something that needs the political will, mm -hmm. but also it's changing the, the, the culture mm -hmm. of the society. So forget, I forgot to mention about the, the government procurement. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, Claire, I want to turn to you. I mean, um, just as a follow-up from, from this question, um, I mean, how has Rwanda benef benefited from having um, you know, more than 50% of its cabinet be made up of women ministers um, and, and more than 60% of its parliament being women. Um, have these, you know, uh, you know, government ministers, have these representatives crafted any legislation that, um, you know, targeted women? Have, have they done anything to improve the, life, uh, the lives of, of Rwandan women? I mean, I'm just, you know, again, playing devil's advocate, but I would like to know whether their presence in government, I mean, is it just a quota? Is it just a number? Or have you seen an impact on the ground in, in policy making? Sure. Including women is not just a nice thing to do. It's a crucial, important thing to do because it really means that you can achieve your goals much uh, more efficiently with women. Come to think about it, I, I like to say it's common sense. Mm -hmm. If you, in Rwanda's case, 52% of our population is women. So more than half of the population is women. We are trying to use our biggest resource for economic development, which is human skills, human capital. Rwanda doesn't have oil, we don't have diamonds, we don't have all those nice things that many other countries have. The most important we have, resource we have to drive economic development is our people. So their skills and the capital they bring. Now, imagine if your biggest resource for economic development is human capital, and 52% of that human capital is women, if you don't include those women, I mean, it's just common sense. How do you expect to achieve 100% capacity when you're only using 50% of your resources? Mm -hmm. Just use that common sense. Even if it's a car, if you're driving a car and you're using 50% of the capacity of a car or a factory or anything, you will get results that are commensurate with 50%. So it's just common sense. But what has it meant for us in real terms? The UN Development Index, uh, ranked Rwanda as the country that had had the most improvement of human development indicators. Now, many countries will tell you economic growth grew by this number, but inclusive economic growth is very important because that shows how everybody across the society is benefiting from economic growth. And make no mistake, Rwanda's economic growth is very high. If you look at the, our last 10 years, we've grown at an average of between 7 and 8% for like 10, 15 years. We are counted among the countries that have had the highest economic development, not just in Africa, but also in the world. Now, that economic de development, what is extra is that it has been uh, seen as, according to the UN, one of the most inclusive. Now, when you talk about human economic de development indicators, what does it mean? It's just a, not just income. It's health indicators, life expectancy. It's uh, malnutrition, how you're fighting malnutrition among children. It's access to education. It's safety. It's security. It's all these things that are also social in nature. That is the one thing that women understand very well, the needs of society. What does society need? What are the social indicators? What do women, what do, what do society need in terms of nutrition in order to become the best possible human capital in the next 10 years? I'll give you just two examples. One of the policies that women championed in Rwanda that has been extremely important is one of fighting malnutrition. If your children don't feed well, it affects how productive they will be in the next 10, 20 years. 
And those children include men and women. If they're not fed well at a very young age, nutrition is extremely important. How many people know about nutrition? Women know about nutrition because this is what they do uh, uh, a lot. So they came up with a policy of building what we call ECD centers, and these are nutrition centers in the most uh, poor areas uh, or villages, so that women could go to one center with their children and get the most basic nutrition, so that they can be fed with milk, because we know that milk is important, uh, where it's possible, vegetables, the right vegetables, the right you know, protein. And this has helped us reduce malnutrition in the country tremendously, at some point, by about six percentage points. Now. If that is not important, and if that is not making real impact in the economy, what, what is? I think that's one really good example that I wanted to give. The second one, and I'll stop on this second one, is also on maternity. A lot of times, because many men, uh, employers, when women get pregnant and they have to go for three or four months out of the office, they look at it as a loss for the company because they have to pay somebody who's not there and employ somebody else on a temporary basis in order for that person to cover for the woman. So they look at it like uh, it's an economic loss. And somehow, to some extent, you're going to pay for two people for that period of time when the woman is not there. You must be ready to do that. To make it easy, one of the policies that our parliament uh, really pushed for, and I think it really made sense to have women on, on the table to come up with this policy, is we put in place something called the maternity fund, where everybody contributes to a fund, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're childbearing, whether you're not childbearing, whether you we have grandchildren or you still have babies, as long as you belong to the workforce in Rwanda, you contribute a percentage of your salary towards the maternity fund. Now, when women go on maternity leave, half of the salary that would have otherwise been paid by the employer is paid for by this maternity fund. That makes it more affordable for employers to actually give women the time off they need to go and become mothers when they have to. Now, that kind of policy, very useful, very practical, but that would have, thought, would have been thought about, especially because women are on the table making this legislation that is required for that. So, Two examples. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. I'm not sure. Oh, time's up. I just, I just saw the message. I won't. But if, my, if I may, just one really quick question. Um, you both mentioned, Your Excellencies, how women empowerment and, and achieving those quotas have been a sort of um, you know, t top to bottom approach. So you mentioned President Kagame's insistence on having women included in, in every appointment that he makes. Madam Vice President, you yourself has, have um, you know, in the past insisted on also having 50% you know, of your cabinet be women. So it seems that a lot of these adv advancements have come from you know, the top down. Um, but we know that for all of this to be effective, <coughs> there also needs to be a sort of a bottom up approach where you know, the people that we're talking to need to be convinced that this is something that is actually useful to, to society as much as this top-down approach. So my last question is, have you faced any challenges, any hurdles, anyone saying, no, this is not useful, um, or, or these skeptical voices that have come from the bottom up? And if, if so, how have, you, how have you responded to those doubters? I, I have to say that uh, I believe that this is from top to the bottom, but also from the bottom uh, to top. And it means that you have to, to, to promote <clears throat> a cultural change. In Colombia, we are absolutely convinced that nowadays everybody wants to have more and more women in power, in the economic power, in political power, in different sectors of the Colombian society. There are some sectors which uh, traditionally have been led by women. Nutrition sector, for example, our first lady, she's a very good lawyer. She has been very focused on nutrition because, as you said, it creates a big difference for people if they have good nutrition when they are a, a very, a, in, in the, their childhood and it changes their productivity and whatever. But there are some sectors that were not in a, traditionally a, occupied by women. And now in Colombia, we have so many women. For example, in our cabinet, we have a ministry of science, technology, and innovation. We have a ministry in, in, in information technology. We also have a women minister in infrastructure, women in different sectors. So, and now people it feels, yes, these women are focused not only in themselves, because they are the first women in ex cabinet. No, they are focused in changing the society. So this is when you have this example at the top. But at the same time, there are so many women in the uh, bottom of the, of the society, in communities, 
uh, fighting in order to have more women as mayors in councils, whatever. So it's because women can uh, change the society. As we both have said, if you include 50% of uh, the entire population, you will, uh, you will double the capacity of the society. If you include this 50% that uh, women represent, you can create more wealth, you can have higher productivity. Companies are very focused in very good um, income and uh, very good profits. So uh, in Colombia, we are clear, and this is something that I can say. All the Latin American uh, economies now are looking very close, the Colombian example, in order to have more and more women in all different uh, sectors of, of power, economic and political are the main sectors right now. Mm -hmm. So I think starting, thank you, starting at the grassroots level is very important. Mm -hmm. Initially, when the constitution of Rwanda required that 30% of women, 30% uh, of political positions are taken up by women, it was difficult to find women. Our leaders would tell us how they would go looking for women to take up 30% and women were not coming forward. To change that, what they did is that they created what they called uh, national gender um, women councils from the village, a village, the smallest village, to the sector, to the province, and then to the national level. That was a way of preparing women. So if you have 30% at the village level, every village in Rwanda, and you have to collect them to the next level, by the time you reach the national level, you have enough women that have had, have had experience. Mm -hmm. And guess what? When we started seeing women coming up, Today, you don't have to convince any woman. In fact, 61% of parliament is women. You almost want to tell them to slow down because you don't want to have the reverse problem where we now need to talk about men empowerment into parliament because that's probable now. So you, but that happened because women were prepared, mobilized, at the end of the day, from the very uh, grassroots level going up. And I think grassroots level approach is extremely important. It's a good problem to have, actually. <laughs> it's not a bad problem to have. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, please have a round of applause for our two uh, speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we hope that you know, your achievements will carry through and to, hope, to, to, to keep hearing more about uh, Colombia's and Rwanda's trailblazing approaches to women empowerment. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.